Um, I'd like to introduce Jesse Castillo of um, Este, who is joined by Michael Becerra. And Este catalyzes liberatory experiences through publishing and public programs. Um, in collaboration with artists, educators, builders, and more, Este remembers and invites other ways of being for current and coming generations. Um, and today, um, the two of them will be talking about VOZ, which is a community collaboration and multimedia project um, that is um, generating a lasting cultural um, resource of contemporary um, Chicanx poetry for um, generations, um, current and coming generations in LA and beyond. Um, this project is also um, featured as an artist project, so um, be sure to check out that link. Um, you can go to the program's um, page and just go all the way to the bottom and there's um, there's a link directly to this project. Um, so with that, here is Jesse. Hi everyone, um, it's so great to be here. Uh, thank you Vancouver Art Book Fair for having us uh, share about Voz. Um, the title of our session and discussion is called We Have the Tools We Need, discussion presentation about Voz. And so Voz is an upcoming uh, project by Michael Becerra, who you'll be hearing from today. And I am the publisher who is helping to make it happen. Um, so I am going to share my screen so you all can see this beautiful presentation that we made. Um, all right, so let's get right into it. Um, so as Vivian mentioned, uh, I am the founder of Este and we're an independent, uh, ah, independent publishing project. And we launched last year in 2019, um, but really have been operating in like self-publishing zines and whatnot for a lot longer than that. What I learned over time was that as much as I enjoyed making my own work, I felt more called to um, support other people in releasing theirs. And that calling came from the fact that I um, come from histories that are really hard to access because of displacement, because of wars, because of atrocities that unfortunately have uh, touched the lands that I come from. And so, as I was growing up and I tried to access these histories, I would keep hitting like dead ends after dead ends after dead ends. And what I realized was um, I didn't want to like recreate that for future generations. Instead, I was you know seeing all of this powerful work happen around me. And I knew that I had the knowledge of self-publishing. I knew that I had uh, such a powerful community um, like within reach to connect with and build with and I wanted to offer something back and so that's what Este is. It's a chance to document what's happening now and it's also an opportunity to leave something behind for the coming generation so that way they have access to the resources and the tools and the knowledge and the creative power and the histories that are being generated have been generated and will continue to come. So uh, we're still pretty new, but uh, we're super honored to have um, some amazing collaborators by our side. And I'll just list some of them here. There's Arlene Mejorado, Audrey Kuhl, Francisco Aviles Pino Jr., Ishakar Kerbayan, Jonah Jackson, Michael Becerra, who you'll be hearing from, Shireen Alhaji, and William Camargo. And some of the projects that we are either currently working on or have already released include Optica, Romneo Drive, Show Me What You Want to Say, Six Months of April's Voice, which we'll be touching on, and then an exhibition catalog for William and Jonah. Um, something I wanted to touch on really quickly is as we go into this presentation, uh, which I'm super hyped about, um, if there's any questions or anything like that, um, we'll do our best to try and answer them as, um, as possible, but you can also reach out to us on our exhibitor page. We have a glorious little chat box there, and so you can type away and I'll be around today as will Michael and then tomorrow as well. So yeah, uh, thank you, Michael, for um, collaborating with me on this project. And without further ado, here is Michael. Thank you, Jesse. Um, hello, Vancouver Art Book Fest, uh, our fair. Uh, thank you for having us. My name is Michael Becerra. I am a multimedia based uh, artist, uh, in here in the San Gabriel Valley, uh, Southern California, where I live with my wife and two sons. I'm speaking to you today from Eastside Cafe, uh, which you'll hear more about later. Um, we're here on Tongva land, more specifically Ost Ostunga. Uh, and I'd like to recognize the first stewards of this land uh, that we walk on today. 
Um, SGV Filmworks is basically a name I use for all my personal passion projects. Uh, I also have a one hour radio show uh, called Soundworks on uh, KQBH, which is a small radio station here uh, based out of um, the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory uh, in Boyle Heights, East LA. Um, you can catch all that on lpfm.la. Uh, I also work on a, as a sound engineer on a podcast called La Historia de las Palabras, which is a show that interviews uh, activists and artists from different uh, parts of Latin America. Um, I also do a lot of media work here at Eastside Cafe and around the uh, land trust that's dev recently developed around that. Um, I'm self-taught uh, multimedia artist uh, whose focus disciplines are photography, videography, uh, visual effects, editing, audio, field recording, really anything that I can learn. Um, I'm not college educated, but I think today we have the access to learn really anything we want and we should all be taking advantage of that. Um, growing up, I had always been fascinated with images, uh, graphic arts, hip hop culture, graffiti, uh, music videos, film and technology. Uh, I love being behind the camera. I love working on projects, sitting uh, in front of the computer and just you know, uh, spending hours uh, editing. Um, I love tinkering with technology. I think it's, it just feeds my uh, curiosity. Uh, and like most Latinx kids, uh, and maybe it's just the parent-child dynamic, uh, I was always encouraged to kind of find a trade or, or some sort of job uh, other than art. Um, but I got a, a, a 35 millimeter still camera one year for my birthday and that was it, I was, I was hooked. Um, I was able to get a job at a uh, local camera store. So I was able to just tinker and play with all the equipment there, uh, read you know, all the books, play with all the different kinds of film. And I really learned a lot there. Um, Photography has always been a hobby of mine, but I think underneath that, I had always wanted to get into uh, cinema and uh, you know video work. Um, at the time, there was no way for me to really jump into that. I didn't know how, uh, and it seemed like the only avenues was like film school or, or college, which I didn't really have uh, the means to do that. Um, so I just continued, you know, with photography, and then after losing my job in. 2008 to the financial crisis, uh, I was able to decide, you know, I'm just going to jump into this full time, focus all my energy on uh, on this art form. Um, I was able to buy a, a Canon 5D Mark II, which was like that new K DSLR camera that came out. You could shoot uh, HD footage on it. Um, and that was around the time where film was kind of on its way out and Cameras were now all digital. It was like a merger between, between cinema and uh, IT. So I was really in a good position because I had you know, both a background in both. Um, and I think at the heart of everything I'm involved with is this passion to create uh, art that highlights authentic narratives and really the belief that we all have a duty to share these skills and talents that we, that we have uh, within our community to support the next generation of whatever craft uh, we're into. Uh, I'm a strong believer that if you're going to be making art, that you should be saying something meaningful and positive with, with those talents. Um, so after making the decision to start putting more energy into video work, I began collaborating and shooting music videos with uh, LA, LA area artists and musicians like Tumex, Olmeca, Irene Diaz. And it was really through Olmeca that I found and discovered the Eastside Cafe here. Uh, shout out to Olmeca. Um, go buy his new album, Define. Uh, next slide. So heavily influenced by the Zapatista movement, uh, the Eastside Cafe is basically a group of collectives uh, that share and maintain a multidisciplinary, multi-purpose autonomous space. Uh, that provides free and cultural arts uh, programming um, workshops to the uh, community of El Sereno and the greater Los Angeles area. Um, it's volunteer run, nobody gets paid here. Uh, we're all volunteers. We, we pay rent with uh, the money we make from the workshops and classes and everybody pitches in to, to make rent. Um, some of the current collectives that, that hold space here are, we have a Son Jorocho collective, uh, Warriors Community Self-Defense Collective, which is like a jujitsu group, uh, a capoeira group, a yoga group, 
uh, we have ESL classes here, uh, women's circle, men's circle. Uh, the space has been here for over 15 years, and recently we were able to prevent the purchase and gentrification of this building um, by organizing and fundraising to be able to purchase the building ourselves. And there's currently a land trust that's uh, been developed to kind of handle the, the stewardship of the building and the land. Uh, Eastside Cafe is a space that's committed to the belief that all people and all communities have the right to self-determination and self-governance, uh, that we possess within our own communities all the knowledge and power to make this a reality. We're not involved with the, we're not involved in a struggle for power. We, we possess that power already and are working to create a positive alternative to the struggles of our communities. Um, it was here that I was able to find a lot of support and encouragement for uh, the work that I was doing. Uh, the space and all the people involved with the space really helped me um, understand what self-determination meant to me as an individual and, and also collectively. Uh, not waiting for anyone to give us uh, permission to create art or, or to teach um, the talents that we have or, or to seek approval, uh, but to understand that we already have everything we, we need. Uh, we don't need um, anyone to allow us to, to, to share these things. Um, and we really don't know what kind of hidden talents that we possess until we find a space that allows us to develop and nurture those talents. And I think that's what I found here uh, at Eastside. So as I became a part of Eastside Cafe, I also discovered other sister spaces and collectives around Los Angeles. Uh, LA is rich in Chicanx arts and culture. And as you go to these spaces and you learn about the, uh, these other spaces that exist, uh, you learn about the history of what came before. I think LA, uh, the East LA area is still in the middle of a, of a renaissance. Uh, there's always creative, uh, you know, creative and radical cultural events going on. And for me, the open mics have always been the most exciting to experience. I would often find myself uh, sitting at these events, kind of looking around the room to see who was recording, uh, who was recording the night um, and hoping somebody was recording. Um, I began to network and, and make friends and we formed a, a collective of uh, a film slash photography collective um, called Elefante. Shout out to Bianca. Miguel, Rocio, Angela, Victor, um, all these people, we all got together and, and we're just started documenting kind of like the events that were going on and open mics and, and working with, uh, you know, creating videos with these uh, poets and uh, musicians. Um, so it was a deeply inspiring time for me, um, being part of Elefante. Um, I believe poetry is the voice of, uh, of this movement. Um, there's a rawness and an urgency to the craft of poetry. Uh, the poets, they have the power to share some of their, some of their fire, some of their flame uh, with you. And to read poetry is one thing, um, but I think when you hear it live, when you're in the same room as the poet, you're hearing their voice uh, bouncing off of you and you know, everybody around you, uh, touches you in a different way. Um, the spoken word really reaches into you and has that effect that can only be experienced through, through that can't really be experienced through reading uh, printed words. Um, I'd, and, you know, as I listen to these poets and this work, I would often come to the realization that uh, so much great poetry from our community has been lost to time and because it wasn't being recorded. Um, and as an underrepresented group in media, I think it's our duty to recognize our inherent power to document and produce our own works of cultural, cultural history. Um, so one day, a few years ago, I was uh, digging through some records and I found records by The Last Poets, The Watts Prophets, uh, records of speeches by Malcolm X, um, Stokely Carmichael, I have some, some of these records here with me today to show you. Um, I've also found some CDs by uh, groups like the Taco Shop Poets, um, San Diego-based group from uh, the 90s who recorded some, some uh, Chicano 
poetry albums. Um, but as I found these, these, uh, these collections, uh, like these powerful, radical black poetry collections and speeches uh, that are still inspiring and, and, and influencing the black community uh, today, I thought, I thought if these collections were created uh, during, you know, we're born out of like these social justice movements, these civil rights movements, then naturally there has to be a, a, like a chicken X counterpart to that. Um, you know, they were both coming, the, the, Chicano, the Chicano movement was kind of being born at the same time as uh, these, black, uh, these black movements, the Black Panthers, uh, civil rights movements. So I thought, you know, there's, there's, Poetry print, there's printed poetry collections from that era, uh, chat books, um, there's the magazine La, La Raza, uh, works of art, murals that came out of these, out of this movement, out of this era. And so I thought naturally there has to be uh, an audio component to that. There has to be audio recordings. Um, so I began looking, you know, every time I would go to the record store, I'd head straight to the spoken word section and I would dig through there a couple of times uh, in case I missed anything. Um, I looked all over the internet, all over eBay, Discogs, um, for anything I could find. I, and I did find a couple collections, uh, but not as many as I thought there should be, um, given the history. Um, you know, poems and recordings that could tell us more about the Chicanex movement and history and experience. Um, so at one point, I was here at Eastside Cafe, uh, probably before a meeting or something, and, and talking about finding these records and not finding, you know, enough Chicano poetry collections. Um, and suddenly realized, you know, maybe at the time they didn't have access to that equipment, to recording equipment, film equipment, um, like we do today. Uh, today, every, we have everything we need in our pocket, basically, um, on your phone. Um, so I realized, you know, what? we have the space here. We know poets. Uh, we have equipment to record with. And should just start creating our own collection. Um, so it all came together pretty organically. It was kind of like the next logical step in the work that I've already been, been doing. Um, next slide, okay. So that brings us to Voz, so about this project. Uh, so Voz is a poetry collection documenting the work and, po and, the work and words of poets uh, from mainly the, the East LA area, but the greater Southern, Southern California area. Uh, the primary purpose of this collection is to contribute to the documentation of Chicanx culture through archival audio, video, and uh, printed matter. Although we live in an age where, you know, some of these events are effortlessly recorded with their phones, uh, with mobile devices, um, I always felt like it lacks a quality. There was always a, lack, a quality lacking, the audio quality, the video quality. Um, you know, always yelling at the at the screen, like at the cameraman to to hold still. Um, so, what I wanted to set out to do was to capture and present the power of this poetry clearly and permanently. Um, culture is a powerful tool, and you know we realize that our communities are diverse, multifaceted, uh, unique. The poets featured in this project uh, remind us to honor our complex past and move forward unapologetically. As humanity faces an uncertain future, I think about the civilizations and cultures whose histories have been fragmented or lost to time or destroyed. Um, and we're forced to think about the impact that we're having today on future generations to come. So Voz is a project that I think challenges us to ask and to answer, uh, what can we do to contribute to our Chicanx culture and history and preserve it for the next seven generations? Um, not only are we amplifying the voices of our community, but we're also offering an opportunity for the youth and the future to experience and connect with these words and maybe spark something that speaks to them, uh, something inside themselves that they aren't aware of yet. Um, so this project is my attempt to document the contemporary uh, Chicanx, Latinx poetry scene here in Los Angeles uh, so that future generations will know uh, and be touched by them uh, like I have been. 
So this is uh, this photo you're seeing here is actually where I recorded everything. Um, recording took place in the summers of 2018 and 2019. And the, the project was originally intended to be audio only, um, being influenced by the, the groups like the Watts Prophets, the Last Poets, the Taco Shop Poets. I knew that I wanted to create a, an audio um, document or an audio documentation of poetry. And in the beginning, I, I actually wanted it to be like a two-part collection. Part one would be um, old recordings that I could, you know, would have to dig around and find and then the second part would be recordings that, that I recorded uh, now. Um, it didn't turn out that way. Hopefully, maybe I can do something like that in the future. But right now, we have our current uh, poets here. Um, I wanted people to hear what I was hearing. Uh, and it was really poets like uh, Alma Rosa, excuse me, Alma Rosa, Matt Cedillo, Iris de Anda, uh, that were I think the biggest influence to get me to start recording or to compel me to start recording, uh, just their, their styles and delivery, um, the content that they were talking about um, really sparked me and, and really, uh, like I said, compelled me to, to start, to take the next step of actually setting, setting up poets and, and recording them properly. Um, and it was also important to me that Eastside Cafe, the space itself was part of the project. Um, all the work that, that goes on here, um, they've been able to stay, we've been, stay, we've been able to stay open for over 15 years. Um, and there's been spaces in the past that have opened up and, and opened and closed. And I felt like as long as the space is here, I should use it and, and have it be part of the project. Um, we could have recorded in a, in a recording studio at the vocal booth, but I wanted the space to be part of the documentation. Uh, and Eastside Cafe is not only this space that we're in right now, uh, 5469 Huntington Drive, it's also next door, the next door space, which we call the Caracol. Um, so we work out of these two spaces. Uh, there's always workshops going on or, or classes going on in these two spaces. Um, the next door space is mainly used by like the jujitsu class, the Warriors Jiu Jitsu. Uh, capoeira, yoga. There's other, there's other people, uh, groups and collectives from time to time that use the space, but I was in that space, there's a closet, which is the, the picture you're seeing now, uh, a closet space uh, that I was able to set up and start recording in. Um, I, I did, I tried to do it as simple as I could, one mic, one light, put up some painter's blankets uh, to muffle the sound or, you know, get a Get the get the audio to you know not be bouncing around everywhere. Um, I knew that that we'd probably get some some car noises. We're we're actually right here on a corner. It's a very busy corner, Huntington and Maycrest. Um, so I knew that we'd probably get some sounds from the outside, which was okay with me because you know it adds to the to the the ambiance. Um, so I asked the poets basically to share whatever they want, as much as they wanted. Some, po some poets shared one poem, some did 10. We had one person who did 30 poems. Um, and everything that I recorded of theirs, I gave to them and, and let them, you know, for them to do whatever they wanted with it. Um, one of the poets had asked me to shoot video also one time um, because they didn't have any clean video of themselves doing poetry. so. I was like, yeah, sure, we'll set it up. And it came out really good, uh, I thought. And so as time went on, it was very important for me that, that I film the poets also um, to document that as well. Uh, some of the poets it, at the beginning, you know, there were some who opted out, but as the, as the project went on, I, I found it more and more important for them to be filmed as well. So I kind of, in some cases, I had to demand that they get, they get filmed. Um, and I, I set it up so that it looked as if they were on stage performing. Clear, clean archival documentation um, that could be, you know, that would just be clear and uh, not fuzzy, clean audio. Um, and we have some samples here for you. 
uh, cut together a few of the, po the poems uh, that we have here. We can roll the tape. This one is called Poodle Skirt. I remember being young. It meant my darkness not being a nail. In my cross, I'd run the soil through my brown fingers and let the soil seep through like water in a strainer. And this did not bother me. My skin matching my soil, my skin matching my mother's, my skin the same color as La India Maria. We did not have many channels, but she was on one, so it must have meant that brown was normal. Then one day, everything changed, and it did not take long for me to catch on that this was how my entire life would be. I was in elementary school and we were choosing roles for a play based off of 50s pop songs. I auditioned for the role of the girlfriend in the leader of the pack. I never played this role. Instead, it went to a pretty white girl with an all-American look. I went home and didn't play in soil no more. Instead, I put my arm against the wall of my room and guessed how many shades darker I was from the white. Ten... 11, 12, I was never good at math, but these were suddenly numbers I needed to know. I still do this sometimes. And I know that after I read this poem, some European-looking Chicana will cry to me about how much she relates to this poem, and I will secretly hate her for it, because to me, she is like a microwave flour tortilla, and I'm so tired of always feeling ugly because of people like them. Because of this day, because of this day, my great awakening, I realized that people did not play with soil, they stepped on it, that my mother would also hold the same self-hate, that La India Maria was actually a joke and not a beauty icon. From what the Bible says, God molded all humans with their own two hands. And so I reflect on this thought and look into the stars angrily and ask this ancient sculptor, if you are the grand creator and your resources are endless, why do I always feel like the only person in this world made of mud? This poem is titled Calling In the Call Out Culture. To those in the streets, but especially on social media, crucifying everyone who stems an inch out of ideological purity, this is for you. Being woke doesn't make you special, even if 100 likes embolden you. Being woke means you walk through many lessons to reach a new understanding of the world and yourself. You must have made mistakes, stumbled on the cracks, even fell on your face. Though not always, being woke probably means you went to college. You probably read about different ideologies, and most certainly, you know language that people in your community know nothing about. Being woke means you come from some level of privilege. So get off your caballito and check yourself. Please know that being woke but arrogant is counterproductive to any message. Being woke but self-righteous is as harmful as burning bridges. Being woke but yelling at people is less effective than speaking with them. Without restraint, woke folks fall into ego traps and starve to search for faults in everyone else but themselves. Please be aware that you can be woke and toxic at the exact same time. You can be a woke pendejo too. What a contradiction, right? Don't use your knowledge for bragging, shaming, and pride. Keep your balance when you are woke because you may find yourself always calling out and throwing blame instead of calling in and opening up space for others to learn from their mistakes just like you did one day. 
everyone's path to enlightenment is different. So let's teach with forgiveness, build relationships with conversations, and remember that growth is a process, not just a destination. This poem's called Canyon City. I wrote it for uh, my students. I teach Latino studies over in Azusa. Driving through Canyon City, find botanicas and barbershops, mercados, and mothers pushing strollers. Mothers pushing strollers down streets named for a citrus pass, schools in a city named for a rancho. A rancho owned by Dalton, a man who sided with the Mexicans during the Mexican-American War. Mexican-American War, what remains today is a romanticized history, but what was erased is the fact that the San Gabriel Valley is indigenous land. Indigenous land, there are spirits that still echo through these canyons. These canyons, these mountains, I breathe the crisp morning air, a tardy bell rings as I watch students make their way, trying to find a way after traveling many roads. Many roads lead to a classroom. They enter, holding back a rumble in their bellies. Too many painful nights, painful nights they don't want to remember. Nights full of stars, they can't even see the magic they are made of. Because in the morning, they sit where it has been erased, degraded, left out of the curriculum. The curriculum, the other teachers say, it's too advanced, it's too challenging, it's too much, it's too real because it sounds too much like the truth. They call it un-American, but this was Mexico once. This was Mexico once, I tell them, but they don't believe me. You only believe what you see. And so they tell me how the cops stopped one the other night, how another has slept in a car, how another has been locked up, beat up, told they're good for nothing, no good, Mexicans, Latinos, Chicanos, brown. Brown, they tell me you get stopped around here for looking suspicious, for looking like you don't belong. Belong where, I ask. Read for yourself in these books. These books were banned in Arizona. Books are still banned in this country because they don't want you to know the truth about yourself and where you come from. If you tell a people they're inferior long enough, they begin to believe it. Listen close. As darkness falls, the spirits begin to rattle their bones, hear them echo through the canyons. As helicopters loom overhead, shining light, you run to darkness as the palm trees sway. Listen to the song they are teaching you. A song that says no more running away from the truth. No more lies, no more foreign miners' tax, no more celebrating lynchings of Mexicans or hangman trees, no more Mexican schools, no more Mexicans can only swim on Mondays because they empty the dirty water for the white people to swim on Tuesday. No more unequal schools, no more draft to Vietnam, no more racial profiling school to prison pipeline or police brutality, no more deportations, no more ICE, no more putting our children in cages, no more calling us names, no more calling us animals, but mostly no more racist counselors or teachers telling you no. No, you can't go to college or take this class about yourself. No more go back to Mexico. No more go back to where you came from. No more go back to where you came from. No more stay where you're supposed to be, here, right here, where they tell you you're supposed to be. Tell them where you're from. Tell them you are brown. Tell them you are beautiful. Tell them you are a smoking mirror revealing truth. Tell them you are flint. And that means your words will cut anyone who tries to tell you you are anything but brilliant. Tell them you are the dreams of your ancestors and how their spirits became butterflies who flew to the night sky and became the stars. They watch over you. Tell them who you are and let the canyons echo your name. This poem is not about mommy's miscarriage. It's not about her guilt of working long hours and leaving me alone growing up. This poem is not about the man she wept for that left us in a new country all alone. This poem is not about her clinic abortion after the wind mysteriously took a pa across the border. Mommy would tell me, mi amor, Mi vida, I had to do it. I had to. I couldn't take care of you and your brother in a new country all alone. This poem is about how I pretend myself to be a bearer of children or a tatarabuela. Oh, how I mourn for a rounder belly filled with a zygote that will live and become a toddler that will fill the walls of my house with laughter. These couplets are about my uterus walls how they open and I glide out, how every day feels like a perpetual flushing that won't come back, me slipping from me. Sometimes I wish I could micromanage my reality the same way I do my dreams, how I would script a uterus to glow towards me, halo, angels singing and all, how I would reach for it and stuff it into my chest and believe in God again and how from my chest children would fly out like doves. This poem is about how I want to be a mother, but a whole body is at war with me. 
But all of this beautiful poetic language ain't enough to make me a better daughter, though. Because I'm out here outing all of mommy's unburied secrets to play the trauma that she suffered. Maybe I want to carry the bricks lumped on her shoulders to know what it's like to be a brick house. Anything. Anything but this meld-bodied cage. I wear her red lipstick. Outline my eyes with black wings like I'm not already some kind of funeral all on my motherfucking own. But even on my loneliest days, mommy walks into the house with a wide smile on her face and says, Mi vida, but why are you crying when you know that everything that's mine has always been yours? Sorry, Michael, you're on mute. So, Edith Anda was one of the poets who uh, compelled me to start recording uh, poetry um, and working with poets. Uh, this is her first book, Code Switches, uh, Fires from Mi Corazon. And she's currently working on releasing her second book on Song, Songflower Press called Roots of Redemption. So, Vancouver Art Book Fair, uh, Edith Anda. Ten four. Wakes up, lace up, black boots, purple and blue baton, packs bullets for breakfast, lines pockets with Miranda rights, will never turn left, especially when following orders, starts the day slow, draws out the gun out of reflex when dark skin comes into sight. Slangs power on their belt while a hook 'em and book 'em anthem plays berries and cherries to the masses. Only wears a body cam when it doesn't clash with the victim's blood or rights. Masks up the bro's bill of secrets. Cause this is the gang gang, the new hood mafia, the wannabe sheriffs in town, the red apple of the machine. One a day kills our children at play and leaves us to grieve while nobody pays justice to society. There is no black, only white. There are no good cops, only bad seeds. Black Eyed Susans for Freddie Gray. There are riots blooming in the Baltimore sun, bouquets of rage in the fists of our sons, orchids of outrage in the shouts of our moms and daisies of distress in the songs of our daughters, empty fields in the house of the forefathers, freedom flowers in the streets to proclaim injustice. We do not need your permission to protest, nor the barrel of your gun on our chest to let the world know we exist. This is the ground being set on fire, for the soil was infertile and the weeds were rising. In the blood that was spilled, the seeds were planted. In the hearts of our people is where they landed. These are the roots of redemption taking hold. These are the shoots reincarnated as leaves of gold. This is the American spring. This is the people uprising. Glow up. Our skin sun-kissed at birth. Some keep reaching for el sol. Look under rocks and white hoods for answers their ancestors forgot to keep. Our abuelas tucked amulets into our braids, formed alliances with the trees to carry messages through their roots to find us. Whispered Pachamama lullabies into our veins, made our mama strong with traditions and cuentos. Our gente is pure gold reflecting el sol, Place us anywhere in the world and we shine sunrise, working where no one else wants to, stretching fingertips into fields and factories of capitalism, placing one foot in front of the other, feeling blessed in this bruised world. Some of them mistake our brilliance for brutality, take our lives under the veil of democracy while spitting racist fumes of self-hate. Our abuelos raised us with a steady hand, placed dirt under our fingernails so we would always have soil to plant gardens strummed guitar strings into our hair to dance with the people around us, made our fathers soft with dreams and drive. Our gente is the minerals that reflect life, place us in cages and we become songbirds of resilience, bringing light to dark histories, awakening the masses to the massacre of freedom, screaming soft cries in front of a wailing wall, feeling betrayed by El Norte. The North Star blinded the people, numbed the people, herded the people. The sun woke up the people, healed the people, freed the people. 
our nanas and tatas encoded stars and maps into our eyes to guide us through this dark age in the United States of America. You can glow up whenever you want to. Que me quema tanto este ardor que llevo dentro. Que me quema, quema, que me quema tanto, tanto. Ready to spit fire, speak of becoming. Native tongue bruised to code switch comes so easy como aquí y there. Weaving pieces of me, stitching genetic memory, tracing ancestral dreams. La lengua mestiza silence cannot contain. The flames, el flor y canto, quetzalcoat breath, jade palabra, flowers in song filled with thorns, nopal blooming. Yuvia words, lightning bolt, deep corazón, silence woman, bleeding hearts, tears of turquesa, words as medicine, sage for clarity and rage for transgressions, subversive tongue, idealist tongue, el dream, our drums, our dance, pluma de locura, transcribing time, transcending tiempo, wild tongue, whispering tongue, blessed lips, ideas flow, sisters burn, speaking truths, this burning is for all of us, awake and full of desire. Singing nubes, smoke spirals, lucid ink spills onto air molecules. Frequency rises, turn up the volume. Aquí estamos y no nos vamos. Que me quema tanto este ardor que llevo dentro. Que me quema, quema, que me quema tanto, tanto. Corazón. Today, I awoke with fire, burning through my heart, speaking universal tongue, my spirit bursting like stars, a strong felt desire to rise up and manifest, feeling ready for revolt. And I ask you, where did you leave your corazón falling under and over the rise of the moon? Someone left too soon and you forgot to close the door. What is in store for you now? What will you reach for soon? An eclipse and setting sun. Tell me, when did you forget that we are all one? Who invaded your divinity, gave you false ideals and compromised liberties, tells you how to dress, what to choose, what you can afford to lose. The reality is you were born free. Daughters and sons of the galaxy, be bold in your search for truth and equality. Where has humanity left their corazón? Sowing seeds of discontent and I can only hope. The system is broken and destined to fail. It consumed you and here we go again. Inner sigh, intuitive eye, a dream unseen. Chaos and creation invented a space inside of you to keep the secret of a people remember it now. You must rise above and cleanse again like feelings and rain. Believe in truth and love and most of all, awaken your corazón. Thank you, Vancouver Art Book Fair. While Michael gets situated, um, I just want to say thank you, Iris. Um, I am crying. Um, thank you, Vivian, for the space. Thank you, Vancouver Art Book Fair, for the space. And now back to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Um, so the current status of the project is uh, recording is completed. Uh, recording's done. Um, we're going through the process of mastering the audio and uh, you know tweaking it so that it's just right. A long-term goal is to have this press on the vinyl. Um, just from the, the influence of these other records that we found, um, I, I always envisioned that this would be uh, pressed on the vinyl. So that's a long-term goal that we're currently looking into different uh, options for funding that or trying to fund that. Right now we're moving forward with uh, printing a booklet and uh, an expanded audio collection. So it would be, um, we, we record, I recorded about 21, 22 poets and um, each poet would have one poem in the booklet and then the audio that accompanies that would be, you know, ex extended as far as how many pieces are included in that um, collection. And, um, but it was really important that, uh, that I release this properly. 
I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the audio guy, I'm the, I'm the video guy, I don't know how to, how to put a book together. Uh, and it was through our friend, uh, Shireen Alihaji, that I met Jesse. Uh, she was like, oh, you gotta meet this, you gotta meet this girl. She, she has a, a, she's a publisher. She can help you release your project. And that's how me and, uh, me and Jesse got uh, linked up together. So maybe Jesse can speak more on the, on the releasing the book part of it. Yeah, and so um, Shireen, who is an incredible human and spirit and connector in this world, in this life, um, put Michael and I in touch. And I remember when Michael reached out about the project, I was just like floored. I was like, oh my God, first of all, that this is uh, taking shape, that this exists. Um, and then to that, um, he was uh, coming to me to work on this project together. Um, I felt so honored um, because this is such a such an important undertaking and is so like, it's part of what I'm deeply passionate about, which is again, like preserving these histories as they're happening now. And then again, leaving something that others can access down the line. And so uh, how I'm showing up in this space is as a publisher. So really working with Michael to obviously release the entire project vinyl forthcoming, but for now the digital um, album will come out in uh, December. But then also the accompanying booklet. Uh, I'm, a, I'm like a book nerd, I love, books, I love paper, I just love touching things. I think that tactility, if you're able to experience it, is such an important tool for, um, you know, uh, or like it's such an important language for understanding um, the world around us. And it's a part of like body memory, it's a part of long life memory. And I think that when you work with like tactile things such as like a book, like you are actually holding thoughts, you're actually holding ideas, you're actually holding power and memory. And um, I'll never get over that. And any opportunity that we have to give physical shape to these powerful works, like I'm more than happy to work on. And so this project in particular, the booklet will have uh, the actual poems uh, from the future poets. It'll be, um, it'll include their bios, um, so you can learn more about them and connect with them. And it also have history about Eastside Cafe, which Michael has touched on, which is such an important autonomous space uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, and again, like uh, the proceeds from this project will go back to serve Eastside Cafe, so that way that space can continue to exist and be a resource for our communities. So. This is our slide where it has our uh, contributors for the project. And if you want to learn more, you can visit our websites, estherarchives.info, sgbfilmworks.com, and eastsidecafe.org. And of course, uh, over the weekend, vancouverartbookfair.com, where we have an exhibitor page um, where you can chat away and find more info. So thank you so much, everyone, for being a part of this. And now we'll thank you. Q and a Thank you, Jesse, Michael, and Iris. That was such a beautiful reading, and all those performances were amazing. Um, unfortunately, we don't ha have time for Q&A, but folks can reach. We know we can reach you over at the Vancouver Art Book Fair table. Um, there's a little chat book um, or chat box there um, for questions. And um, yeah, thank you again so much for for um, for all that you're doing. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so so much. Um, this is amazing. <laughs>